good late afternoon. Um, an earlier session than usual because of the South African um, load shedding schedule. So we finished off on 19.2 yesterday, and we'll then continue with the Course of Miracles. Chapter 19, the attainment of peace, and 19.3, the unreality of sin. Now, this is again one of those very important fundamental understandings that when you can transcend this understanding, really brings you into the state we're all desiring and why we're pursuing awakening, enlightenment, atonement, or the Course in Miracles. We're all looking for happiness. We're all looking for peace. And I'll start off with setting a question to you in that. When last did you feel really peaceful? When, did you really, when last did you feel complete and total peace? When last did you sit quietly somewhere, mountaintop, on the beach, wherever? in your lounge, wherever, and just feel an all-encompassing peace. You must have, because you're searching for something you know is possible. You must have had a glimpse of what it feels like to be happy and to be peaceful. Now, you can only be happy if you're peaceful. And you can only feel peaceful if you're happy. And the extension of peace and happiness is what we call joy. It permeates right throughout us. Everything we look upon us reminds us of it. So somewhere in our life, we must have had that experience. And yet, we don't really experience it. That which you think you're experiencing when you're in a state of happiness, peace, joy, love, is actually not an experience. But when filtered through the body senses and perceived by the brain and witnessed by the mind, we then believe it's an experience or sensation when an actual fact that is what the essence of you is. Of course, we call it experience in our physicality. But if you cast your thoughts through the memory of that experience, you'll realize that it wasn't so much as an experience as it was an awareness of a mind of a mental or a awareness, an awareness of even beyond the mental state of the sense, the sense, not the sensation, the sense of peace, of happiness, of love. And that sense is the sense of self. That is you in touch with your real self, your true self, the Christ mind, the right mind. When you're in your right mind, you're in a state of awareness, of peace, of happiness, joy, love. And so the next time you're experiencing happiness or experiencing peace or experiencing joy or experiencing love, realize what you're experiencing as a body-mind is your, the very self the self you search for, the Son of God, as you permeating through the body senses. We call that an experience. And so when we return to the full knowing of ourself, that all-encompassing sense of self is peaceful, joyous, loving. And Let's understand what are the blocks to that? How, what prevents us from knowing ourselves as that? If God has created us and God is joy, peace, and love, how come we don't know ourselves as that? 
And it's because we bought into a tiny mad idea and that, uh, that tiny mad idea started with a sensation of fear. Led us to believe that we have done something terrible, we call that sin. And as a consequence, we carry guilt. Now, again, ask yourself the next question. Have you ever felt guilty about something? Have you ever done something in your life that has made you feel guilty, where you've hurt someone intentionally or not? Whether you said something or perhaps physically harmed them or put them in a position where they suffered and experienced the sensation of guilt, mild guilt, gentle guilt, heavy guilt. And when you were experiencing guilt, it was obviously because you believed you had done something terribly wrong, sinful. And at that moment, when you felt that overwhelming sense of guilt, peace was completely blocked out of the way, completely unattainable. And for ourself to be known by the self, because your true self knows itself. The false self, the body mind identity, is searching for the for happiness. And when it finds that happiness, it therefore finds the true self, the false identity dissolves. And with it goes any attachment to this world. And of course, as a consequence of letting go of this world, you also let go of any memory where you feel anything but joy. And so guilt disappears. And there's a softening of our focus, a softening of our attention. We are no longer focused on the objectification of this world, of objects, people, places, things, and events. And also of self, the identity dissolves, fades, softens. The personality is still there somewhat, although it will become gentler, definitely more humorous. Um, it'll accentuate the happier parts of our persona, personality, identity. But in order to get to that, there has to be understanding, a fundamental understanding between the difference, the difference between sin and error, mistake. What is a sin? What is a mistake? Did you feel guilty because you made a mistake? If you felt guilty for making a mistake, that can be addressed when you understand that did you do it on purpose? No, it was a mistake. Can you correct it? Can you apologize? Yes, then you can correct it. No more need for guilt. But if you believe you have sinned, then what takes away the guilt? And then we have to make up elaborate stories to make ourselves feel less guilty or absolve ourselves of guilt. And in Christianity, we've come up with the idea that our Savior, the Son of God, descended on this earth, died for our sins. And so if we believe in him, if we follow him, if we give our lives to him, which is a very strange notion, because what does it mean to give your life to a Savior? Do you just stop living and now worship him 24-7? These are strange ideas. And then we believe that through his death or through his blood, now we're absolved of, of guilt. But does the guilt really go away? If we haven't understood what we've really done or not done, which is a more appropriate summation of this world. So the unreality of sin, sin is not real but we've all been taught and told to believe it is. The attraction of guilt is found in sin. So sin, if you committed a sin in your mind, 
you immediately feel guilty. But the attraction of guilt is not found in error. If you've made a mistake, the consequence isn't error. You may feel a little remorseful because you've done something wrong, but you'll immediately try and correct it. And therefore, if you've done, if you've created a sin, you're most likely going to repeat it because now you, you've done it once, so you might as well do it again. Um, think of the idea of maybe when you were younger and you believed in the Christian idea of no sex before marriage, but you sneaked away with your lover and, and did. And uh, you felt, oh my gosh, I've sinned now. But when the hormones kicked back in, when you got turned back on, you sinned again. And even you might even be attracted to the very idea of it, especially if you have an authority problem, which is a common problem amongst the, the fallen mind. Sin will be repeated because of this attraction. So it's sometimes ooh, guilty pleasures, we call it. Fear can become so acute that the sin is denied the acting out. So that's, that's the exact opposite. So some people, because of religion and henceforth the dogmatic fear-based religion, would create so much fear in some people. Think of the, the earlier 14, 15, 1600s when religion really was at the, at the forefront of world dominance. And you know, no sex before marriage, and people would just abstain because the fear of being punished. So they would deny the sin, but only in action, not in their desires and fantasies. While the but while the guilt remains attractive, the mind will suffer because it will want to, even though it may fear it or feel guilty, and not let go of the idea of sin. So you play out your guilty pleasures, and then, of course, there was always a, you know, religion is very clever, so you could do penance and pay the church and go and ask for forgiveness and do 20 Hail Marys and five Our Fathers, and you'd be forgiven. Now, normally, partly, be to spirit to son to, okay, just don't do it again. Now, oh, you're back. Pay your money. Put your money in the box. Forgive you again. And, um, and you would just get into the routine of, of paying for your sins. And then you'd be absolved of guilt and you felt better because there was some, some form of exchange. So very clever, very clever marketing people back in, back in the day in the church. They realized, well, if we could just get them to pay for something, then um, at least they feel better because they've paid something and now their idea of sin is gone. But it never really goes because you sit and wonder whether or not You've really been forgiven by this judgmental God, which you've been led to believe is an entity out there watching every single move. And because, of course, he's omnipresent, he can watch every single one of us all the time. For guilt still calls to it, and the mind hears it and yearns for it, making itself a willing captive to its sick appeal. And many of us today, you know, we have these ideas of how we should treat elders, our parents, our children. And even though we know that what is being asked of us isn't true, isn't right, isn't morally right, or doesn't align with our highest ideal, we then rebel against our parents or authority or society for doing nothing wrong, but the sin idea sits there, the guilt sits there, because you you You've been taught that you have to respect your parents. And so you can have a horrible parent that treats you horribly and you, you just suffer under them because you know, of the sense of duty and guilt that you've been taught. Then you just you struggle with it and you're completely unhappy, but you you stay true because. It's what the Bible says, you know, honor your parents, even though they may be criminals. On the other hand, you may be treated badly and eventually you put your hand up and go, enough of this, uh, until you're able to treat me with respect because I respect and love self and therefore you will too. If you cannot, I'll just completely ignore you and you won't see me. But then we carry the guilt thereon. And so the ego traps us 
in both directions, never really truly letting us escape the idea of sin and guilt. Sin is simply an idea of evil that cannot be corrected in the mind and yet will be forever desirable. Think of religion. Without sin, they wouldn't have a business. So to the most important thing for religion is the idea of sin. And it's very desirable, and they talk about it all the time. As an essential part of what the ego thinks you are, you will always want it if you believe you're a body. Therefore, you believe in your identity. And only an avenger, Iron Man, here we are, with a mind, with a mind unlike your own, could stamp it out through fear. So you'd have to get to a point of fear to stamp out that which you fear the most. So it's a bit of a doppeldanger. The ego does not think it's possible that love, not fear, is really called on, called upon by sin and always answers. Because love always answers. Always. For the ego brings sin to fear, demanding punishment. And that's the bottom line. It requires some form of payment exchange. Either you pay for it by penance and money to the church or whatever, that your sins are forgiven, or you give away money to charity because you're feeling guilty, or it demands punishment of you. You punish yourself or those that have sinned, you want to punish them, put them in prison for life. No, re no reformation, punitive, punitive only. And there's even a term in law called punitive damages, damages for punishment. Punishment. Love, world loves punishment. Look at 80% of movies are about vengeance, either love stories or vengeance. Okay. Yet punishment is another form of guilt's protection. For what is deserving punishment must have been really done. So we make it real and then we want to punish it. Punishment is always the great preserver, preserver of sin, treating it with respect and honoring it, its enormity. For what you think is real, you want, and you will not let it go. So if you believe sin is real, you want some form of punishment. And even Course in Miracles, non-dualist students, we talk, we talk a good love song. We talk a good forgiveness verse or two. But let that politician or that criminal or whatever, and we want to hold that person to blame. I think a couple of months back, uh, that actor, Pirates, whatever his name is, the uh, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Depp. Yeah, Johnny Depp, that dude, the pirate, and his girlfriend, and the world, I have no idea what she's like, or what the, I don't know, but they will turn out to be a sociopath. I didn't, didn't watch any of the, I'm not interested. But man, whether she was right or wrong, that we love, punishment and they made her out to be a witch and that's the end of that kid's career that young girl's career is ruined when she what she really needs is to be loved and coached and helped and maybe she does have a psychosis maybe she needs counseling but what do we do we just put her on this tv and we over and over and over again i think it was last week or the week before some old lady dies, and before you know it, it's massive headlines everywhere because she once wore a crown. Never mind the hundreds of nations that her country enslaved and how many people have suffered as a consequence to that, but she wore a crown. And she had nice little puppy dogs, and, and she, she rode a motorcycle once, and... She gave money to charity. And yet old ladies die every day alone in their apartments or old age homes, and no one sheds a tear. And so we love to take our guilt and hide it and not give it any attention, hoping that it goes away, and then celebrate other people's lives in order to make ourselves feel better because the old queen represents every old lady that died alone. And now we feel better because we mourn her. The ego is a strange device that 
plays with us like a toy and we listen to it attentively and we give it so much of our attention and punish ourselves for its judgment on us, not realizing it doesn't exist and yet has convinced us it is us punishing ourselves. An error, on the other hand, is not attractive. If you've done something wrong, put something into place, put some corrective actions into place, change the way you behave, get some coaching, do a course, speak to a guru, speak to a teacher, and you've shown another way. So you don't really feel that bad if you've made a mistake, unless you're an accountant. Accountants always feel bad when they make mistakes on paper, on, with numbers. What you see clearly as a mistake, you want corrected. Ask any account. <laughs> Rakesh, if you're listening, that's just for you. Sometimes the sin can be repeated over and over with obviously distressing results, but without the loss of its appeal. And so sin stays very appealing. Because think of, think of every time you've done something sinful in your mind. Of course, only when you were a youngster, because now you're all Course in Miracles students and none of you sin anymore in your mind. So just when you were young. Think how it stayed with you, and yet you gave it a lot of attention and it, it excited you in some way. You know, Sweet 16 and all that other stuff that you did. And suddenly you change its status from sin to a mistake. You realized, I was wrong about believing it was sin. It's just a mistake. I shouldn't have acted that way. But it's unpunishable. It's not punishable. It's not a sin. It's not one of the, I didn't go against one of the Ten Commandments. I just ate ice cream before my dinner, which I used to feel very guilty for because your mother once told you it's a sin to eat dessert before dinner. And then at some stage you realize, no, it's just a, my mom made a mistake. It's not true. I'm going to have an ice cream. It's not good for me. I should eat my meal, but I haven't. And yeah, these slight pangs are guilty, but it's just a mistake that you really should eat your dinner first. I don't feel that bad. It's just ice cream. Tastes good anyway. Now you will not repeat it. You won't repeat the idea that you're punishing yourself and you say, hang a second, I now I have dinner. It didn't taste good. That was a mistake. That's why we have dessert last. I won't do it again. It was a mistake. You will merely stop it and let it go unless the guilt remains. And if you think, oh, this was, this, I sneaked an ice cream. I sneaked a cigarette while my wife wasn't watching. He'll do it again. You get a hit out of it. For then you will keep, you will, you will but change the form of sin, granting that it was an error, but keeping it uncorrectable. This is not really a change in your perception, for it is a sin that, for, for it is in sin that calls for punishment, not error. The Holy Spirit cannot punish first flat out, can't, because it's just pure energy. Cannot punish sin. The Holy Spirit cannot punish sin. Mistakes he recognizes and would correct them all as God entrusted him to do. Now, you all understand what I say about Holy Spirit. It's your highest self. It's the memory of God and you as the son in you. And of course, it's always going to see from a place of right mindedness. So if it you recognize self and catch the mistake. It's the right mind catching. So when you catch an error, realize it's your higher self. It's your Christ itself. It's your Holy Spirit catching it. And the minute it puts a correction into place, it's the Holy Spirit, you, correcting it. Don't think of the Holy Spirit as some entity that descends upon you like a white dove and then inside you here somewhere. It's the very essence of the purest you, the self. The awareness that is aware, the I am. The I am in you corrects the error. But sin he knows not. The essence of your truth, right minded, is completely unaware of sin, as God is completely unaware of this world. God knows not of the world of bodies, the world of planets, the world of physicality. God simply knows his son, the extension of his love, is asleep and dreaming. And God has no idea what he's dreaming. And so he spoke his voice into his son's dream using storytelling. And the voice, which made from the same essence as his son, then reminds the 
activities of his son's dream, us, activities, what we are. And as soon as we respond in understanding and knowing to that which we are, the voice calling us, the voice reminds us that we are the same essence as the voice. So God's Holy Spirit, the essence of God's Holy Spirit, and the essence of your spirit are identical. And it's that which calls forth for us to awake. But Sinni does not, nor can he recognize, nor can he recognize mistakes that cannot be corrected. Mistakes that cannot, that the, mistakes that the Holy Spirit doesn't recognize are not mistakes. And if he recognizes it, the self recognizes a mistake, it immediately puts a corrective measure in, not to be done again. Or maybe still once or twice while you finding the right thing to do, but you're already correcting it. For a mistake that cannot be corrected is meaningless, the Holy Spirit. Mistakes are for correction. And they call for nothing else. Remember, in truth, we've never left heaven. There's no need for correction. There's no need for the voice. But while we're dreaming, it seems like we're cor being correct. What's really happening is we're letting go of the amnesia, the obstacles to peace, and the light we are is coming to the surface, coming into awareness of being awareness itself. What calls for punishment must call for nothing. Every mistake must call, be a call for love. That's all it is. What then is sin? If every mistake is a call for love, what is sin? It's a mistake calling for love too. What could it be but a mistake that you would keep hidden? So the difference between sin and a mistake is a mistake you're willing to work with, sin you want to hide. And you hide it behind layers upon layers of guilt. Let go. Because guilt makes you sick, causes cancer, and causes every other disease known to man. Which is why mankind will never find a cure, a permanent cure for cancer. Because cancer is just guilt coming to the surface in the, and into the organs. That's it. Guilt equals cancer. Don't go into fear now. Let it go. Holy Spirit can correct anything. What could it be but a mistake you would keep hidden? A call for help that you would keep unheard and unanswered. Bring everything to the Holy Spirit and let him heal all of that for you. He being your highest self, the essence of you that is completely one with the essence of God, the extension of God's love, that which you are. In time, the Holy Spirit sees, clearly sees the Son of God can make no mistakes. You make no mistakes. On this, you share his vision, yet you do not share his recognition of the difference between time and eternity because you believe you're aging, you're traveling through time. And one day you will, this body will die. Holy Spirit doesn't see that at all. And when correction is complete, time is eternity. And so time never existed because eternity is always here now. And always here now has never had a past or a future. It's always eternal. And so this entire lifetime and lifetimes you've ever had will collapse in an instant. And you'll recognize it never really happened, but appeared to happen over billions of years. And yet, in truth, it's always here now. There's no years. It's the eternal now, the eternal love, joy, peace, which is God. The Holy Spirit can teach you how to look on time differently and see beyond it. Stick around in this group. I will definitely be the messenger for the voice that will show you how to see time differently. It's one of my favorite teaching modalities but not while you believe in sin. Now, I welcome all sinners to my group, especially those who smoke, but by the second lesson, maybe the third one, if you really carry sort of deep Catholic guilt, definitely if you're Greek or Portuguese or maybe Spanish, then you carry a lot of it. Maybe then it takes a year but it shouldn't last longer than that. If you're truly willing to be happy, are you willing to be happy or do you want to hang on to your misery? Does it, do you feel alive when you feel miserable and you'd rather feel miserable than feel nothing? Patty last night asked a question. 
And she said, but I'm losing interest. I'm struggling to focus on anything. Of course you are. As you awaken to self, the focus softens. Awakening, there's a softening of all senses. And the awareness, think of awareness. Try and put awareness into, make it tangible. Awareness of awareness, tangible. It's like the wind. There's a softening. There's, there's, you don't want to pay attention to anything because there's nothing to pay attention to. And so, while you believe in sin, you believe in time because you replay it over and over again. When there's no sin, there's always here now. And so, in error, yes, but this can be corrected by the mind. But sin is the belief that your perception is unchangeable and that the mind must accept as true what it is told through it. So now you must believe what the mind is telling you. You must believe what the mind is telling you. Based on what someone else has told you, you need to believe. And you bought in it to some time, even though you didn't like buying into that idea, but now you hang on to it because you've experienced it and you experience the sensation of guilt and you liked it because it made you feel something. And then not having anything else to feel, you wanted to hang on to the guilt because guilt makes you feel alive. Time to let it go and feel a completely different type of life. So if the mind, if it does not obey, the mind is then judged and sane. How dare you? You're a rebel. You don't fit in. You're not doing what everybody else does. You're not the kind of daughter, son, brother, husband, wife that you should be because that's what all those other roles normally behave and have throughout time. So how come you're, you're being the rebel? How come you're not married by the time you're 30 with four children by the time you're 36 and um, a, doubting, a do, you know, doting housewife and, uh, and a loyal husband and, and, and go to work nine to five, never question, be happy with your mediocrity. And um, it doesn't matter if you're unhappy because you're providing for the family. Oh, no, you just quit. Oh, no, you said no. Don't go. Oh, and now we try and make you feel guilty. And you just go, no, thanks. You're mistaken. If you're willing to look at it differently, it can be corrected. You realize you made a mistake. But I'm not buying into any of your nonsense. You can keep your guilt shit nonsense to yourself. How many times do you need to step on horseshit to know that it shouldn't step on those little piles of horseshit? How many times do you want to scrape dog poo off the bottom of your shoe before you realize stepping on dog shoe results in having to clean the shoe? Okay, you've stepped in it once. How many times are you going to do it? Next time you look where you walk, it's just a mistake. Don't do it again. Same thing with any experience in this world. You made a mistake. You didn't know any better. Don't do it again. Didn't feel good. I'm sorry. Won't do it again. The only power that could change perception is thus kept impotent, held to the body by fear of changed perception, which its teacher, who is one with it, would bring. So. Your teacher, your, your teacher, your self, your highest self, your holy self, your holy spirit self will correct it. But you keep it weak and impotent because you won't listen and you push it away. You won't, you, you're not willing to look at it anew. You want to beat yourself up. You want to feel guilty. You, you, don't, you, you believe you're right, but you're told you're wrong and you want to believe you're wrong. And so you hang on to it, even though you want to believe you're right. And we get trapped in these circles. And we often use religion and dogma and societal hierarchical parental type teachings to get trapped there. The religion of Judaism is perfect for that. And they have their weekly gatherings and the breakings of the bread to keep the family together. You know, and you can go and screw around, but you better marry in the, within the, the, the religion. And so that's why we keep you together. Because we're so afraid you're going to wander off and do your own thing. And then who's going to take, of our, take care of us when, when we're old? And so we just project our guilt onto our kids, those of them that have kids. And, um, and those kids do the same to their kids. And then we say that. But these are very tight-knit societies. And should anyone break away, there's always that guilt. And especially in the religious Christianity idea, Islam as well, the idea of, of punishment and hell after death. 
if you haven't gone according to the rules and the laws and the dogma. Taoists don't have that. The Buddhists don't have that. You just return, you return as a cow or a worm, but you're not going to burn in, 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 in eternity. But in Judaism and in Islam and in Christianity, man, we love the idea of <laughs> sending you off to Helios where you go and burn forever. Forever. Because, you know, God is a very vengeful creature. It's ridiculous. And you know it's ridiculous. And yet, you don't want to shake the guilt because it makes you feel something. And we're still attracted to it. And you go, but I'm not attracted to guilt. You are. If you weren't attracted to it, you'd put it down and let it go. You're attracted to guilt, which is why you stay. And you know better. And it's now time to call upon the Holy Spirit, to call upon yourself to return into your full awareness. Say no more of this wrong-minded nonsense. Right-minded only. I'm dreaming and nothing I've done in my dream, no matter how horrific I was. I could have been mini little Hitler running around. It's no longer true. I forgive myself. And as a consequence of what I did, I'm going to make it right. I made a mistake. I'm not going to make it right. I'm not going to. It's not about penance. It's about correction. Penance is believing you're sinful and then atoning for your sins by trying to punish yourself through some corrective action. Correction is I'm, I was wrong and I want to make it right because I want to serve those who I've harmed in order to bring them to peace, bring them to happiness. Very different to punitive um, measures. When you're tempted to believe that sin is real, remember this. This is vital and I highlight it in, in, in spiritual purple. If sin is real, both God and you are not. If creation is extension, which we know for a fact it is, because God extends, the creator must have extended himself, and it's you or here. And it is impossible that what is part of him, you, is totally unlike the rest. If God extends, Everything he extends is everything. And so you, the very essence of what you are, not the part that fades, ages, and dies, but the essence of what you are, must be like that which created you. And so in the old Bible, we hear that we are made in God's image. God's not an image. God is essence. So we're made from God's essence. So our essence, our self, that's the word for God's essence, extended as our self. God's essence, the self, the son, the holy son, the holy spirit, self, not body, the essence, is exactly like God. Same quality, same essence, the extension of. Yesterday I explained fingers are part of the hand and the fingers extend. Are the, are the fingertips not part of the hand? Call it fingertip. Is the nail not part of the hand? It's all part of the hand. Just because it's extended outwards doesn't make it any less of the hand then the palm, the whole thing is the hand. Same with you, You're the extension, that's all. If sin is real, God must be at war with himself. He must be confused. He must be angry with himself. And that's why I say that, that idea that there's a Satan can be separated. Now, God is fighting Satan for the souls that God created and, and shoved into human beings. It, the idea is just so preposterous if you just look at it with simple logic it's just preposterous because if there is a satan what is he made from the same essence as god if god is made from unconditional love when did evil come from isn't it more plausible to realize we're dreaming just a tiny mad silly dream so god must be split and torn between good and evil partly sane and part Part, partially insane. For he must have created what he what wills to destroy him. Wow. And has the power to do so. See where the idea of cancer comes from? That parts of us can actually want to kill it, will kill us. This is the see how cancer is directly related to sin. If you believe you're a sinner, the body manifests cancer. Is it not easier to believe that you have been mistaken? than to believe that God is lost and split and angry with himself and part of God wants to destroy himself, that part is called Satan. 
It's just ridiculous. While you believe that your reality or your brother's reality is bounded by a body, you will believe in sin. While you believe that bodies can unite 11 minutes at a time or against something else, as they do, you will find guilt attractive and believe that sin is precious. For the belief that bodies limit mind leads to a perception of the world, which is the proof of separation, seems to be everywhere. So bodies then become proof that we are individuals with individual identities. And God, if we believe in him, is an objectified something there that we cannot see. And therefore, God and his creation seem to be split apart and overthrown. God is there, you are here, and there are those that, that are on God's side or God's on their side, and then there's the enemy. The Bible's filled with such stories. God would take sides and then nuke, nuke the opposition. So he made them too, um, but they worshipped a different God. So let's get on the side of these oaks and then just nuke the rest. And then Jesus came along and then God was on the side of the Christians only. But just beforehand, he was on the side of the Jewish nation. Mm. And of course, only in that region. So the Chinese, Australasia, South America, they don't get any of that. Oh, but we spread Christianity. So now they have, they have an opportunity to believe in Jesus and be saved too. Do you see how preposterous that whole idea is? Do you see how ridiculous and lost the idea of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has become? The Trinity has split the idea of sin, the very thing that Jesus brought through to try and teach us and to share with us was lost in translation because it's a silly little organism called a human being that put on a little big golden hat, called himself the church, the Pope, the religion took the most beautiful, non-dual, at-one-ment teachings of the Christ and messed it up because of the desire for power and the belief in guilt, sin, and fear. Christianity misses the mark, sins, misses the mark by an inch, by an inch. And because of that inch, it has separated us through 2,000 years of separation. Yet, it's so simple to return back to it by the realization of the Christ within as our highest self, where we're all joined as one in our Father eternally, in joy, in peace, and in love. For sin would prove that God, what God created holy cannot prevail against it, nor remain itself before the power of sin. Sin is perceived as mightier than God, before which God himself must bow, offering and offer his creation to its conqueror, Satan, evil. Is this humility or madness? It's utter madness. If sin is real, it must be forever be beyond the hope of healing, for there would be a power beyond God, God's capable of making it another will that could attack his will and overcome it and give his son a will apart from his and stronger still that he could then overthrow God's will. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that the, the almighty power, the only power of God could be overthrown by something which is an extension of himself? Hmm. The whole thing is preposterous. And I was, I was a young boy. I was nine years old when I went, this is nonsense. I didn't have the intellectual backup that I have now. And even as a young nine-year-old boy, I went, this, there's no way. There's just no way this is true. And because no matter how fearful they try to make it, my love for truth was more powerful than the fear of evil. And here I am, the rebel, the rebel teacher. And each part of God's fragmented creation would have a different will opposed to his and an eternal opposition to him and each other. War forever in all directions. And when you die, yeah, well, you bugger then too. <laughs> you're screwed. But you could go for a barbecue if you're lucky. 
your holy relationship has as its purpose now, teaches for God, the goal of proving this is impossible. And it's just nonsense. Don't even bother proving it. Just you know, prove nothing. Just give it away. It's like enough already. <laughs> you want me to prove what? You prove it. You prove the opposite of it. You prove. Well, first of all, show me God. And then you can. Then we can start. I'll show you my experience. Oh, no, it's not. Okay, well, then yours isn't us. We just stop there. Let's just stop. <laughs> uh, it's uh, why even bother? Why even bother talking about it? Just let it go. Just like don't prove anything. <laughs> oh, that's why I'm laughing. Heaven has smiled upon this mad person. Heaven has smiled upon it, and the belief in sin has been uprooted in its smile of love. Love just turns to laughter. Smile just turns to laughter. Laughter turns to love. You see it still because you do not realize that its foundation is gone. Its source has been removed, and so it can be cherished but a little while before it vanishes. Enjoy this world while you can. Pretty soon you'll awaken, and they'll just go, and there'll be a feather, and you'll just wake up. That's it. Okay. Only the habit of looking for it still remains. So it's just you're so used to seeing it. Eventually, even that too shall pass. And yet, you look with heaven's smile upon your lips and heaven's blessing on your sight. You will not see sin long. For in the new perception, the mind corrects it where it seems to be seen and it becomes invisible because it's not, it's not real. Errors are quickly recognized and quickly given to correction, to be healed, not hidden. You will be healed of sin and all its ravages the instant that you give it no power over you or your brother. I give it any power over them. That, that means not apportioning, not attacking, not blaming. And not, you know, we, we, we either want to beat up the world or we're victims of the world. Think about the kind of person you want to be with. Do you want to be with someone that's always trying to beat up on others? Or do you want to compete with the kind of person that's always being a victim of others? Jeez, Lou, there must be another option. Yes, there is. There's one that's neither nor. There's one that's just peaceful and happy. Doesn't want to hurt anyone. Won't be hurt by anyone. The true jihad is, don't give permission to hurt this. No. 30 inches from my nose, the frontier of my person goes, and all the untilled air between is sullied yet unseen. So, stranger, I beckon thee that unless with bedroom eyes, don't franktonize. I have no gun, but I can spit. Hmm. Or suck my Glock, pick one, you know, but no. Do you want to be the victim? Ooh, tell your story ooh, all the time. How do you like when someone comes in the room and just tells you, oh, I'm see, I'm see, the world's gone to shit. This one hurt me, uh, you know, fell off my bike, broke my head. Ooh, the world's a shit place. My boss was an asshole. My husband's this, my wife is that, my kids are this, my parents are that. Ooh. You want to be with that person? Really? You like victims? You, you want to be with victims? You want to feel holy? I want a victim. I want to be surrounded by victims. I could be like Jesus. Would you want to be with us? I fucking hate the world. It's fucking murder, killed. Everybody's horrible. Everybody's sinful. Everybody's evil. We're the good guys. We're oh, fuck them all up. You want to be with that guy? How about with someone that's just peaceful? You can't impose. And he either plays with you because he wants to or not at all. Either wants to be with you or not. Stands his ground. Yes, no. No, thanks. Don't like vegetables. No, thanks. No. Don't eat vegetables. Don't have to explain. How about that person? Won't that person make you feel empowered to stand your own ground? So think about that the next time you meet someone. Are you the kind of person I want to be with? Are you going to blah, 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 all your shit onto them? Blah. Is that what you're going to do? Blah. Or Grrr, the whole time. <laughs> Should be an actor. <laughs> I'll do myself. Cats looking at me looking out like a man. Hey, Christopher, I'm mad. Yeah. But I'm happy, man. That's the important part. I'm happy. 
How about just wanting to be with people who are just happy being themselves, not imposing their victim or their bulliness onto you? Remember this before you meet other people again, before you blah. Be the Christ. Be present. Be here now. Be as you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Be that. And you will help each other overcome mistakes by joyously releasing one another from the belief in sin. There's a correction. One another. See? They sinned when they wrote this course. One another. I hope my English teacher be so proud of me now. But they say person that can spell a word in five different ways is highly creative. Thank God for spell check. In the holy instant, whilst I'd be going to English jail for life, in the holy instant, you will see the smile of heaven shining on both of you. And you will shine upon each other in glad acknowledgement of the grace that has been given you. Grace is joy. For sin will not prevail against the union heaven has smiled upon. Your perception was healed in the holy instant heaven gave you. Forget what you have seen and raise your eyes in faith. We spoke of faith yesterday. Willingness to what you can see. Be willing to see heaven <laughs> here now. Excuse me. The barriers to heaven will disappear because they're just illusionary barriers. Before your holy sight, for you who were sightless have been given vision and you can see. You've come this far. Don't stop now. The world is going to lose its flavor. The world is going to lose the, 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 the stuff you wanted, the guilty pleasures. Stay. I urge you, stay. I've been through it too. I chose to stay. I'm happy. Never been happier. This wasn't a happy person. So this is an angry, vicious person. Vicious. I'm sure you get glimpses of <laughs> the bat comes out every now and again. <laughs> Person personality still there. But I'm happy. I'm not trying to convince anyone. This is free. If I can, you can. This isn't the saintly Jesus born, happy, happy little guy. Now go around healing everybody. This was angry. This was vicious. This had skills, a certain type of skills. I make movies about this shit. This was angry, vicious. This is happy now. I can, you can, you will, you will, you will. Be willing and you will. You will when you're willing. Thy will be done. God's will be done. Look not for what has been removed, but for the glory that has been restored for you to see. Look upon your Redeemer and behold what he what would show you in your brother and let not sin arise again to blind your eyes. Look upon your Redeemer, look upon the Holy Spirit and behold what he would show you in your brother and in you, because it's the same. And let not sin arise again to blind your eyes. Call upon the Holy Spirit. Look upon your Redeemer. And who's your Redeemer? Your brother. And behold what he would show you. In your brother, in himself and in you. And in his brother, which is you. And let not sin arise again to blind your eyes. We're all one. For sin would keep you separate. But your Redeemer, Holy Spirit in you, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit in him, one Holy Spirit, one Son of God, would have you look upon your brother as yourself because there's only one of us. Your relationship is now a temple of healing because you're willing to let it be. This is a holy companionship. This is a holy relationship. Every one of you watching this, this is us. I don't know how many people watch this video. A hundred. I'm lucky. If you're lucky. Whether you watch it today, a year from now, it's the same. Yeah, we are. 
holy brothers, holy companion. This is us healing. As I share, I am healed. I'm reminded more and more by sharing the joy that I am. As you receive this and it reminds you of what you are, the joy returns and we are healed as one. And now our relationship is a temple of healing, a place where all the weary ones can come to rest. Who's the weary one? The whole world. Because as we shift, we become another light in the mind, another light in heaven. Symbolic. Heaven is completely lit. Here is the rest that waits for all after the journey of this long idea of sin, fear, fear, and guilt. And it is brought nearer to all by your relationship with your brother, your willingness to see in you, your willingness to be the love of God. I'll stop here and we'll do some questions. And so we continue at Course in Miracles, text chapter 19, the attainment of peace, 19.4. The obstacles to peace. In this sentence is the purpose of the entire course. This course, it says right at the beginning, is not yet to teach you the meaning of love, but to show you the obstacles you've imposed, you have imposed, on knowing yourself as the love of God. Now, you've heard me say, Many a time, and I know people are often surprised and quite confused when I say this, you cannot love anyone. You cannot love God. If you take it in the direct translation of what I'm saying, you cannot love. To love is not an activity. It's not something. How do you, how do you love God? Just think, of how do you love God? Put your attention on God. Try not objectify. Think of God without objectification. Try. As you sit here now, try and think of God without objectifying God. Can you? So the only thing you can do is be present. The presence of awareness. The awareness of presence. The awareness of being aware. That awareness is love itself. Love is not an activity. Love is an acceptance of awareness as awareness itself. You cannot love God. You are the love of God. God is love itself and has extended himself. And you are that extension. You, the dreamer, the son of God, dreaming. And therefore, what do you dream of? You can only dream like yourself, like yourself. So you dream of love. And an error came into your dream, a mistake. And so you're still extending the love of God. But you misperceive what you extend. You misperceive love and see it as objects, people, places, things, and events, the universe. What you actually look upon is love but misperceived through the filters of fear and so seen as objects, bodies, people, places, mountains, buildings, planet, universe. The essence of everything is love. Misperceived, it looks like objects, subjects, experience. You cannot love someone. The closest you get to unconditional love in this world is the acceptance of what is and the acceptance of one another, the recognition. God, you are the love with which I love thee. Brother, the love I am recognizes the love you are. And in that recognition, the obstacles to peace, the obstacles to love, the obstacles to separation, the obstacles to sin, fear, guilt, God. And love knows itself as love. And you know yourself as the self, which is the son of God, that which is the extension of God's love. That's what this course in any non-dual teaching does. It brings you into the awareness of being awareness itself. The peace of God that transcends understanding into the knowing of ourself as that which is 
the love of God. One with its source in the eternal now, forever joyous, forever peaceful, forever the happiness, which is love itself. As peace extends always, you're not aware of it, but it always is. As peace extends from God, so peace extends from his son, so peace extends from his son's activity, you are the son's dreaming activity. And so as peace extends from deep inside yourself to embrace all the sunshine and give it rest, I rest and abide in God. I'm spirit and my spirit rests and abides in God. It will encounter many obstacles when you're still divided in your awareness between wrong mind, the world is real, right mind, I'm spirit and I abide in God. Some of these obstacles you will try to impose on others. Your beliefs, your dogmas, and your demand for attention, recognition, or whatever the hell it is that we want. Others will seem to arise from somewhere you don't know, elsewhere, or from your brothers, because they're imposing stuff on you, but realizing you're projecting it's coming back at you. And from various aspects of the, the world outside. So if it's coming from your brothers and various apps aspects of, of the world outside, what you project, you receive. What you give, you receive. Forgiving and having are one and the same. What I give to all, I receive from all. What I give to one, I receive from one. Yet because of your willingness to see anew, to know anew, thy will be done. I will to will thy will. Amen. Yet peace will gently cover them, extending past complete unencumbered, completely unencumbered. Because God's power has been given you because of your willingness to see in you. And you need to believe this. Because as you believe it, it will extend and make itself known. You think it's a sensation. You think it's an experience. But it's an all-encompassing sense of self that permeates through the body and you'll feel the tingling as the love of God extends through you, reminding you that you are the love of God. The extension of the Holy Spirit's purpose for your relationship to others is to bring them gently into your heart space. It will quietly extend to every aspect of your lives, surrounding each of you with glowing happiness and the calm awareness of complete protection. And you will carry its message of love and safety and freedom to everyone who draws nigh unto your temple, into your heart, where God abides, where healing awaits for him. And thus you will know you have it and are it too. You will not wait to give him this. You won't, you won't be able to wait. You want to do this. For you will call to him and he will answer you, recognizing in your call, the call for God. And you will draw him in and give him rest as it is being given you and is given you right now. And all this will you do. Yet the peace that already lies deep within must first expand and flow across the obstacles you place before it. Obstacles, ideas beliefs, dogmas, fears. This will you do for nothing under, undertaken with the Holy Spirit remains unfinished. You can indeed be sure of nothing you see outside you, but of this you can be sure. The Holy Spirit, your essence, your holiest self, asks that you offer him a resting place in your awareness and in your heart, where you will rest in him. So the Holy Spirit asks nothing of you, but that you become aware of him as yourself and rest in that. And knowing that as you rest in that, you rest in God. He answered you and entered your relationship with all. Would you not now return his graciousness and enter into a relationship with him? Lord God of my being, make yourself known to me 
as that which is the authority and the direction of my heart, my mind, and my soul. For it is he, your highest self, your Christ self, who offered your relationship the gift of holiness, without, without which it would have been forever impossible to appreciate your brother because you'd remain asleep and not know it's all you. The entire universe is you. And everyone that you've projected out there is one with you. There's only one son, one son dreaming. And now you're awake. And so be grateful to those you projected outwards that seem to hurt you. Because when you eventually had enough and asked for, I, there must be another way. There must be. He has shown you. And now you be grateful to those people that seem to hurt you, seem to drive you insane. Because had they not, you wouldn't have gone searching for a better way. So let's be grateful to all those people in the world that have hurt us. As they're not, we would not know we we're dreaming. So your gratitude you owe to him, to your brother. He asks, but that you receive it of him so that you can know you are healed. And when you look with gentle graciousness upon your brother, you are beholding him. You, because you hold him, you create him. For you are looking where he is from the place of your holy self, your holy spirit, and not apart from the holy spirit, for you are it. You cannot see the Holy Spirit. You can't see the awareness of the awareness that you are. But you can see your brothers truly. Not in their physicality, but know that they are projections of the self-same mind. And the light in them, because you've chosen to see the Christ in them, will show you all that you need to see. And what do you need to see? I am. And no more seeing is needed. When the peace in you has been extended to encompass everyone the holy spirit's function here will be accomplished so what you thought was an external descendants of god's holy spirit upon you is now self-realized as that which is the i am i am that i am the awareness of being the awareness itself the all-pervading peace love joy gentleness happiness of awareness itself and even those words are, are, are poor graphic descriptions of the true essence of awareness. For what need is there for seeing then when God has taken the last step himself and brought you in and that you now know you the extension of his love, the Holy Spirit will gather all the thanks and gratitude that you have offered him and lay them gently before his creator, your creator, in the name of you, his most holy son. And the Father will accept them in his name. What need is there of seeing in the presence of his gratitude? It just, that's just phenomenal. It's just the most beautiful part of the course and one of the most important parts of the course. I'll stop there and do some questions. And so the next section course in miracles text chapter 19 the attainment of peace we move on to chapter 19.5 and now we look at the obstacles the obstacles to peace and one of the obstacles to peace sounds crazy but it's true is the desire to get rid of it so the first obstacle the desire to get rid of peace the first obstacle that peace must flow across is your desire to get rid of it now one may argue, but hang a second, I don't desire to get rid of peace, but let's see how we do it. It's quite subtle. Well, peace cannot extend unless you keep it. And there is the trick. Because what extends, extends from you, from God's Holy Spirit, from you, through you, to, to the rest of you, the world. You are at the center from which it radiates outwards to call the others in. So, Erpi, this is exactly what you're going through. You're the center from which God's love extends through you and wants to touch all. And that's why you feel gratitude for self and yourselves and the whole world, which is in your mind. You are its home. You're the home of the whole universe. It's tranquil. It's happy, peaceful, gentle dwelling place. 
from which it gently reaches out, but never leaving you. So as you share, it extends and it feels like it lasts forever and it will keep growing as you keep sharing. If you would make it homeless, how can you abide within the son of God? For you are the son of God. If it would spread across the whole creation, it must begin with you because the whole of creation began with you, the dreamer. And from you, you reach to everyone who calls and you bring him into your heart by seeing him as Christ and by joining with you because it's all you. You're now taking the position of the dreamer and the responsibility for having dreamt all of this up. And now you choose to heal all of it as you heal. And as you heal, you extend healing to all of it. Why would you want peace homeless? Why wouldn't you want it in your heart where it's home? What do you think it must dispose to dispossess to dwell within you? And it's the idea that it has to get rid of my desire for the world and therefore my sin for your guilt. So what does peace cost me? It costs me my desire for the world. How has your desire for the world made you happy? It hasn't. Let's try another way. Let's try and not want anything in the world. Let's try and heal the world through our own healing. Let's seek for God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all else shall be given us. Because why did we want the world anyway? To make us happy. Didn't make us happy. Let's return to God where we abide in happiness. And once we abide in happiness, let's allow it to extend through us. What seems to be the cost you are so willing, unwilling to pay? What do you think you're going to lose if you just become the love of God? Or oh, we're going to lose the attachment to the world. I'm going to be lonely. I'm going to be sad. Just the opposite. You'll never be lonely because you'll be filled with joy and you'll extend this joy to all and all will come into your heart. The little barrier. The idea, the tiny little barrier made out of thin little sand like glass. It still stands between you and your brother. Would you reinforce it now that you've come so far in your understanding, in your transcendence of understanding into the knowing of yourself as that which is the Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Son of God? You are not asked to let it go for yourself alone. Christ, you ask it. Christ asks it of, of himself for himself. Christ asks it of you for himself, for he is you. He would bring peace to everyone. And how can he do this except through you, which is the same mind as he is? Would you let a little bank of sand, a wall of dust, a tiny seeming barrier stand between your brothers and salvation? Tiny mad ideas. And yet, this little remnant of attack you cherish still against each other is the first obstacle the peace in you encounters in its going forth. It's the belief that others don't deserve to be loved unconditionally because of what they've done, because of the criminals, the rapists, or the whatever, or your parents, people that have hurt you, lovers that abandoned you, people that rejected you. They don't deserve it. You want love to be special between you and someone else. Love is for all equally in the same way. This little wall of hatred would still oppose the will of God and keep it limited. Until you love your brother as you love yourself, you cannot love God. The Holy Spirit's purpose rests in peace with you. With you. Yet you are still unwilling to let it join you wholly, completely. You would still oppose the will of God just by a little. Oh, I still want this in the world. Still want a special love relationship. And that limit is a limit you would place upon the whole. Because the minute you limit once, you limit all of it. Unless you love it all unconditionally, you cannot know yourself as the unconditional love of God. God's will is one, not many. It has no opposition, for there is none beside it. There's only one will, and it's what God wills. What would you what what you would still contain behind your little barrier? The secrets in your mind and keep separate from your brother seems mightier than the universe, for it will hold back the universe and its creator. You, the dreamer, this little wall would hide the purpose of heaven and keep it from heaven because you would then not know yourself being the Son of God in heaven eternally. Would you thrust salvation away from the giver of salvation? 
for such have you become. Peace could no more depart from you than from God, for you are the peace of God. Fear not this little obstacle, this tiny mad idea, this idea of sin, fear, guilt. It cannot contain the will of God. Peace will flow across it and join you without hindrance. Nothing will stop it. Salvation cannot be held from you. It is yours because you are it. It is your purpose. The purpose is to remember you are. That you've never lost it. You just think you forgot. You cannot choose apart from this. You have no purpose apart from your brother, nor apart from the one you ask the Holy Spirit to share with you. The little wall will fade, will fall away so quietly beneath the wings of peace. For peace sends its messengers from you to all the world. And barriers will fall away before their coming as easily as those you interposed will be surmounted as easy. I will to will thy will. And you feel it expand and you want to share it. And that's the gratitude flowing through you. You cannot love God but you can extend your gratitude to that in the recognition that you are the love of God. And so God, so the St. Francis of Assisi, his prayer was, Lord, you are the love with which I love thee. So you're the love with which I love thee, meaning you're the love in which I abide and share with you. To overcome the world is no more difficult than to surmount your little wall. Because that's what it is, an illusion. For the miracle of your holy relationship, and this is what we're having, holy relationship, without this barrier is every miracle contained. There is no order of difficulty in miracles, for they are all the same. Each is a gentle winning over from the appeal of guilt to the appeal of love. How can this fail to be accomplished whenever it is undertaken? It cannot fail. Guilt can arise, can raise no real barriers against it. These are old ideas we've let go. And all that seems to stand between you must fall away because of the appeal you answered through your willingness. From you who answered, he who answered you will call. His home is in your holy relationship, your heart, where all relationships extend from God itself. Do not attempt to stand between him and his holy purpose, for it is yours. But it, let him quietly extend the miracle of your relationship to everyone in the world, in it as it was given. So your holy relationship with God's Holy Spirit and your highest self, the Christ mind, and you first and foremost is now complete. Now you extend it and you love your brother as Christ loves you, for you are the love of Christ as Christ is the love of God. One son, one father, oneness. There is a hush in heaven, a happy expectancy, a little pause of gladness in the acknowledgement of the journey's end. For heaven knows you well, as you know heaven, because that is your home, and it is the home in which God abides in you. No illusions stand between you now. No more. You're done. You've gone past that way. You've gone past halfway. You're there now. Now we're going to start extending. That's what it's going to take us next. Look not upon the little wall of shadow, this little body mind. The sun has risen over it. The sun, the light has come. How can a shadow keep you from the sun? No more can you be kept by shadows from the light in which illusions end. Every miracle is but the end of an illusion. Such was the journey, such is its ending, a miracle. And in the goal of truth, which you must, which you accepted, must all illusions end and will end. The little insane wish to get rid of him, whom you invited in and pushed him out, must produce conflict. You pushed your brothers away, Garden of Gethsemane. He says, return and know we are one. As you look upon the world, this little wish, uprooted and floating aimlessly, can land and settle briefly upon anything, for it has no purpose now. Before the Holy Spirit entered to abide with you 
as you, as your heart. It seemed to have a mighty purpose, this body-mind ambition, and the fixed, unchangeable dedication to sin and its results. Now it is aimless, wandering pointlessly, causing no more than tiny interruptions into love's appeal. So we start to lose our attraction to the world and we start to lose our focus on objects, people, places, things, and events. And we seem to get a very gentle gaze, a loss of attention and a relaxation. Attention requires tension. Attention requires tension. Relax. Peace comes. And you still go and play in the world. You still pour yourself in. You don't starve to death now. And you're not going to be poor. You're going to lose everything. It just, it's just no longer, because now you become willingly the acceptance of love. And so you seek the kingdom. You've found it. And now all else has been given you. And the, it becomes effortless. And you will be still driven passionately to act in certain ways. But you can do nothing in order to receive it other than to be willing to receive it. Now that you have, we pour it back into the world. This feather of a wish, this tiny illusion, this microscopic remnant of the belief in sin, tiny mad idea, is all that remains of what once seemed to be the world, seemed to be the world, seemed to be the universe. It is no longer an unrelenting barrier to peace. This world can no longer trap us. We're no longer interested in the news, in the viruses, in the politics. We just realize it is what it is, and I make the best of where I am, and I just share the love of God with all. Its pointless wondering makes its results appear to be more erratic and unpredictable than before. Yet what could be more unstable than a, than a tightly organized delusional system? Its seeming stability is its pervasive weakness, which extends to everything, and therefore it will fail and dissolve and no longer be true. The variability the little remnant induces merely indicates its limited results. It cannot last. How mighty can a little feather be before the great wings of truth? Can it oppose an eagle's flight or hinder the advancement of summer? Can it interfere with the effects of summer's sun upon a garden covered by snow? See but how easily this little wisp is lifted up and carried away, never to return, and part with it in gladness and not regret. For it is nothing in itself and stood for nothing when you had greater faith in its protection. Would you not rather greet the summer sun than fix your gaze upon a disappearing snowflake and shiver in, in the remembrance of winter's cold? The light has come. The son of God in you has risen and awoken in you. And you realize we are one. You are that which dreamt the dream. You localize this as body mind. You were unhappy because the world seemed to attack you, but you attacked the world. You wanted a better way. You demanded a better way. You shouted at the heavens, show me another way. And you found this course or another path of non-dual mysticism. And here it is. And you're returning through your willingness. It wasn't easy. At times, it felt like it was abandoning you. At times, it felt like it was asking you to abandon the world, to sacrifice. But you stayed true, and the light has come and lit, and lit your mind. Your mind has gone in the right direction, right-mindedness, where you join with the Christ mind, the mind that is fully awake as the Son of God, knowing it's dreaming, knowing all characters are part of itself. And you return to that Christ mind place where you know you're the dreamer. And the world starts to fade from your imagination, fade from your sight as you realize, I am that I am. I am the love of God. I am the love of God extending God's love. And now that I remember I'm God's love, I extend God's love through me to all the creations I made, wants to defy God. And now a memory of God. Everything is an echo for the voice of God. Everything is an echo for the essence of God. And I now choose to see the Christ in everything. And as I see the Christ in everything, I recognize the Christ in myself. I know myself, the awareness of being awareness itself. The non-dual understanding that I and my father are one. 
And as my father extends love, so I am the love extended. And I return in peace the knowing that I've never left the kingdom, for I am the kingdom in which God abides. And I abide in God, for God is spirit, and I am spirit. And God abides in me. God's spirit abides in me as me, as my essence. And my essence, my spirit abides eternally in God's spirit forever, in eternity, in the eternal now, in the joyous knowing of myself as that which is love itself. Amen. We'll stop there. We do some questions.